essentially address a problem within cinema. Make a movie about a movie theater. That's so meta, it's fucking sick. The importance of revival cinema and culture is it's, it's really no different than uh, a conventional museum. The sense of revival means giving life, and this is, uh, this is life it's giving not to the movies don't need, that they're already set, they're going, eternal. Well, the life they're giving is to the viewers. We are the ones who get a chance to see something we wouldn't see anywhere else. The idea of movies being resurrected, I mean, this is, this is one of the things that I love about a revival house, a movie that can continue to live, that can have, or, or, or can have a new life. I think that's, um, that's just money in the bank. That's fantastic. I've never been more moved than running a Charlie Chaplin film this year and watching audiences respond exactly how they responded all those years ago, how his movies still transcend time. It's beautiful. Revival houses remember that. They remember that they're supposed to touch your, your heart. I'm, I'm a child of revival cinema. When I, was a, I, when I was in high school, I would get on the bus to New York to go to the New Yorker Theater, uh, where they ran the most fabulous uh, old double bills. And uh, it was long before home video, and there were no place to see these films. Now the, the argument is, well, now we have more films available to see on video than we've ever had before. And it's true. There are more films available now uh, than there ever have been in my lifetime. But the problem is that, A, you have to know what they are. Somebody has to point you to them and say, look, this is a, this is a movie worth your time. Uh, and the other thing is that, that many of them need to be seen on a big screen. Even the cheapest pictures were made to be seen on the big screen. And that experience is not the same as watching it, even at home with two friends. We're telling a story about the New Beverly as a character within this bigger story of the end of a format. Well, I think the New Beverly is a really perfect example of a revival cinema because we've been around since 1978 and because we're in Hollywood. So you have something that there used to be so many theaters in Los Angeles and one by one they've all died. We still have a few revival cinemas left in Los Angeles, but not as many as you would think for a city that revolves around film. And that's the thing that makes me really nervous is if you have a place like the New Beverly where it should be packed every night because this is a town hypothetically full of film lovers, but it's not. And so if the New Beverly can't survive in Hollywood of all places, then what hope do we have for the other revival cinemas around the country or around the world? What is absolutely true is that the best way to see a movie is in a movie theater. And that is why I think the New Beverly is successful. Watching a movie there with, with, with an audience that's really into the movie is better than any theater I've ever been to in my life. It feels like this great 
party, like like the frat house without the douchebaggery. It's very much like chicken soup. You know, if you're feeling sick and you want to feel better, you, you come to the new Beverly and you feel better. It's a family business. You see the, the same folks, the staff is small. It's like literally going from your home to another home. I picked my first apartment based on proximity to the new Beverly. It, it's a little it's a little gem enclave in in, uh, in LA that, that there really isn't anything like it. I mean, there's some, some competing venues that do good work and, and also have a, a community vibe, but there's something about the new Beverly that just rises a little bit above. I found uh, the rep house that I'd always dreamed of being able to go to, and it was the new Beverly. It's just perfect. It's definitely a 70s movie theater. You get that vibe the moment you walk in. You get the ticket that you tear off, the old school concessions, and the place looks like a place that's been around since the 1970s. Even with the upgraded seats, which is beautiful because they're not even brand new seats, they're seats from an older theater from the 90s. They're great and it's fantastic, I just, but I just, I just love that. Even when the marquee was uh, upgraded, it's upgraded to look exactly like it used to when it was brand new. It's a constant. It always has this sort of well-worn feeling about it. I love going there. There's something about it that's just kind of reassuring, and in a sense, it's a, it, you could call it a temple. It's a temple to movies. One of the very, very, very few who are not eating out of anybody's uh, hand. They are totally independent. And so it's always been kind of a, a little haven, I guess, for me, in, a, in this great little escape uh, far away from the you know, the multiplex. It has a very special place in my heart. It, it really was just an extension of film school going to the New Beverly. As a high school dropout, it was film school for me. New Beverly is where I learned about movies. I think if you date me for any period of time, it's like only a matter of time before like, you gotta go to the New Beverly. If I win the goddamn lottery, I would give it all to keeping the New Beverly cinema going. Quite literally the one place that I could go and felt like I belonged and I wasn't alone. It's nicer to see a movie at the New Beverly than it is at some crappy multiplex. It's got charm. Eight bucks for double feature on film, and it's projected right, hopefully, if I'm doing my job right. Um, that's a good deal. Well, the ticket prices at the New Beverly are awesome. Well, I can get a full night's worth of entertainment for me and my friends and family for less than $20. You pay eight bucks for two films, and you step into this community that is whatever you want it to be. If you want to just come in and order a drink and go sit down in the seat and watch the film and get up and leave afterwards, you totally can. If you want to chat it up, meet new people, and talk about it with the owner, with the people who work here, you can. And like standing outside the new Beverly is like sort of, you know, where the film geeks are, like sort of in between the movies or after like a midnight at two o'clock in the morning, there's people still standing out in the street talking about films. That's, that's, that's a community, you know? It's a thing that used to be really common that doesn't exist in the same way. And not just the location or the style or the types of things that it shows, but there's a spirit and a culture um, an experience uh, about it that is unique, that, that feels very safe and familiar and celebratory of film. I also think it's really interesting that the clientele asks me what I think of the movies all the time. And I can't think of another movie theater where it would even, even occur to me to ask the girl who's giving me the popcorn what she thinks of the film. It is the entire cinema experience because you have 35 film, you have that organic connection to it, and you're experiencing being in an audience in those seats surrounded by that chatter and the smell of the popcorn and you've got your drink that is the movie going experience and that's why that's why you go to the new beverly I love the New Beverly because it's independent and stands for everything I believe in. It's kind of anti-establishment and owned by a family and cheap and not about consumerism. It's really about the love of film and a community of people who love film getting together. I moved to Los Angeles in 2001 and I almost immediately found a New Beverly calendar. And the calendar's so incredibly groovy and old school and just spoke to me immediately. And I saw it and I said, 
this is where I have to work. This is the place for me. And the first time that I went, I asked Sherman Torgan, the owner, for a job. And I asked him for a job every time I went back for five years. I was there every time she asked for a job and Sherman tried to brush her off and she was very insistent. Eventually he caved and he gave up one of his own shifts for me. Um, and right after I started working there, he said, why did I not hire you five years ago? And I said, I don't, don't know. Um, so I started in May of 2006 and it's been fantastic. In 1929, the building the New Beverly was in, 7165 Beverly Boulevard, originally opened as Slapsy Maxie's, which was a nightclub opened by Slapsy Maxie Rosenblum, who was a famous boxer at the time. And in fact, Martin and Lewis did their first uh, gigs in LA in that same building. It went through a bunch of different changes from the 40s through the 70s. There was some live theater that was done there. Uh, at one point, it was called the Capri Riviera, which was a split, which meant that the theater was split in two, and there were two screens. Um, the theater's so small, I have no idea how they did that. And I've been going to the New Beverly since I came to LA. Uh, I have to confess that when I first came to LA, the New Beverly was not a revival house. It was uh, a porno house. And my excuse is that I was actually reviewing porno for a trade magazine called Film Bulletin, back when we used to review things like that. Porno is particularly fun to write about. You could be so snarky. And in 1970, it became the Beverly Cinema. Now, the Beverly Cinema was a porno house. The landlord at the time, his name was Howard Z. Howard had been this porno director and producer who'd um, done Flesh Gordon, which is actually a great movie. He basically realized man, I'm making these porno movies and I'm sharing the profits with a the theater and who knows how they're cheating at the box office. So he basically said, oh, I'm gonna buy my own theater and will book my own porno movie so I get 100% of the profits. Around 77 or 78, the LA Times stopped taking ads for porno theaters. And so suddenly his business just dropped. And so that's when Sherman decided to take it over. Sherman Torgan and uh, some partners bought it. And because the marquee says Beverly Cinema, he didn't want to pay to replace the marquee, so he just changed it to the new Beverly Cinema. It became a revival house, and this is in an era when, in Los Angeles, there actually were a lot of revival houses. And there were a lot of prints, of course. This was Hollywood, and there were studio prints to be had. And it was pretty much a movie lover's dream. The new Beverly was always a somewhat smaller uh, venue than the other places, but they were, the projection was good and uh, the people really cared and it was very intimate. Sherman Torgan was simultaneously a, a father figure, a fellow traveler, a culture warrior. Sherman Torgan, this smiling homunculus in that scratched up window, He's like something out of a, a Dan Klaus comic strip. He was here every single time I came here. I would go to see something there, and Sherman would be at the box office, then he'd walk in, and then Sherman would come around and work in sessions as well. Like, he was the only person sometimes. He always had that weird energy of, like, I'm getting to put on a show and show movies tonight. And he was a wonderful person and really committed to what he did. And even on the periods when he was down because the theater wasn't doing very well and he started making those noises like, well, maybe I should pack it in, you know, I'd, I always would, you know, give him the pep talk, but I kind of felt that deep down inside he didn't really mean it. Because, you know, what would he do? I mean, this was his life. He actually knew how to run stuff up in the booth, too. We'd have stuff break down up in the booth, and Sherman might be like, well, we got to stop the show, and we got to do this. And Sherman would say, fuck that. And he'd grab this new, take the old projector head off and take, put a new one on, slap it on, and say, OK, let's go. Back when he was a hippie, he would just fuck with the system. He had great stories about how he would get like a jaywalking ticket, and then he would insist on going to a trial with a jury just to fuck with the system. There was one time when a customer had come up to the counter and been really rude to me. And I went up to Sherman afterwards and I was like, God, that guy was such an asshole. And he said, he can't talk to you like that. Tell him to fuck off and get out. And I, that's like Sherman in a little capsule for me. I started going in 95, this was like the summer of 99, and I'm buying a ticket for yet another double feature. And he's like, I thought you'd be showing me a screenplay by now. And it was like that way, and that was the moment. And he wasn't trying to be mean, but it was like the, you, you don't need to come here as often as you are. It was almost like, you need to stop hanging around the high school. You've graduated. This, you like, go out and do other things. Monsters do have their place in the zoo, in your nightmares, in the deep. 
in your favorite horror movies. But not in your living room, on your TV. There will never be anything that gives you the beauty and the enveloping sense that actual 35 millimeter film does. It is actually about a mental connection that we have with those images that are dancing on the screen because they are real. They actually exist on film with a light going through it, with a shutter dropping in front of it. The sound of celluloid going through a projector and going over the spindles and coming up on the take-up reel, that is part of our movie consciousness. You make that sound and everybody thinks of the movies. You know, someone who can actually project 35 millimeter properly is, you know, it, it's a dying breed. There aren't too many left. I get a lot of comfort from knowing that there's a projectionist. There's, there's a maestro. There's, there's uh, uh, someone who knows more about, about it than I do in a weird way. You know, it's the comfort. It's like a bus driver. You know, nobody ever gets on the bus and thinks like, oh my, this bus driver is going to like, no, you don't think that. I mean, maybe if, you know, projectionist is and the bus driver or you have totally lost drunk. me I but i'm just you're like I'm going, ahead, no, no it's, it's like it's like having a tour guide it's like having somebody who's just sort of you know gonna kind of hold your hand along the way a real pre yeah Aww, when i'm okay. not on set with you okay you know i'm gonna keep doing this for the rest of the interview though it's gonna get awkward at some point it's all right go ahead <laughs> my niece and nephew don't get the concept like i showed my niece a piece of film and i'm like look light shines through this onto a big screen that's how it works oh if somebody walks you through how a projector works and they say... As the film moves through the projector, it first enters the picture section. In this section is the projection lamp, which is a very bright light source. This light is concentrated on a single frame of the film by a condenser lens. The brilliantly illuminated frame of the film is then projected by the projection lens onto the screen. As the film moves through the picture section, it stops momentarily on each frame. Next, the film enters the sound section. Here, an exciter lamp passes light through the soundtrack area of the film. Sound waves cause the light beam to vary in brightness. This makes the photocell produce electrical pulsations, which are then amplified and fed to the speaker. And that's how you watch a movie. I had no idea how weird projectionists were until I started hanging out at the New Beverly. Like, projectionists are a specific type of person. I just don't think we're good with people. Yeah, they are they need to socialize more and get out of the booth. That's why more projectionists are, are like alcoholics or, or gone mad or really weird. They're really weird and I include myself on there. Are crazy people drawn to be a projectionist or do they become crazy because they are projectionists? I think you become crazy. It's a stressful job. I would have New Beverly nightmares. The job of a projectionist is to make their job as invisible as possible. If the sound goes off and they have to say, or focus, you know, they know I'm there. <laughs> I don't want them to know. I want to just keep it, everything going right. Even making the lights go down just dim while they don't even notice it. You don't want to know somebody's projecting this. You want to enjoy yourself. You want to get lost in the story. I don't think anybody has as much fun when they're working as somebody who works at the New Beverly. I often think, where else would these people work? There's two people who work on the floor and a projectionist, like three people per night, that's it. They're just nice, except Matt. What's up with him? He smells like Fritos that have been left in the sun. It's really weird. Walker. He's someone who loves movies, but is very serious about his movies. I'm not a very customer service oriented type of guy who happens to have a customer service oriented job. But it works, because it's the new Bev. He's the Hitchcock connoisseur of the new Beverly. Being a big Hitchcock fan growing up, I watched everything on VHS. And so it really wasn't until the new Beverly that suddenly I can see them for real. And you watch something like 
the birds, and it's a whole different movie. Marion, who is my best friend, also works at the theater, who is just sweet as pie and just smart cookie and loves movies and has loved the New Beverly as long as I have. <laughs> Marion, who's an actress, writer, and director. Very professional, prim. Looking hot while she's like filling my drink order. She's so beautiful and she's so talented and she can really do it all. I've met filmmakers, actors that I've admired for such a long time. Um, I've got to screen movies that are some of my favorite films. I am Henry. I have been a projectionist at the New Beverly since approximately 1981. I love Henry because he always looks slightly perplexed. He loves music. Any movie that we talk about, he's like, it's composed by so-and-so. I'm retired. I am no longer projecting. I am projecting at the uh, New Beverly. Uh, Vinny is our main projectionist, and he is just a goofball. Usually the funny stuff happens to everybody else, and I come down, and, and, um, and then they tell me what happened, and I say, oh, that's funny, haha, and I go back and run the movies and stuff. Has one of the most endearing traits of madness that I've ever seen in a person, which is quacking. Vinny makes this duck sound. I don't know where he picked it up from, but he just walks around quacking. He kind of walks by you, and he kind of goes Wah! as he walks by you. And I'm not really sure what that's about, but he does it all the time. Wah! 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 But I think he's been doing it for so long that it's become like a, a subroutine of his existence, where he just will be quacking and probably not even realizing it. It's probably something from the autism spectrum. Could you demonstrate a quack for us? Quack. Quack. And he also likes to uh, pit Matt and I against each other as far as who makes the best popcorn, because he constantly tells me that I make the best popcorn. No, seriously, it's really good. Like, I tell Matt, but it's really you. And then he goes around and tells Matt the exact same thing. He says my popcorn's the best, too. Does he? Yeah. Son of a bitch. Who, who would you say makes the best popcorn at the New Bev? You do. Michael Torgan, who is Sherman's only son, took over the business. So he is now the owner of the theater. My dad opened this theater when I was uh, seven, uh, going on eight. So it's been in my family for most of my life. He does all of the pickups and drop-offs of the film. He books everything. He does all the concessions. He's printing the calendars. So he's a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. Michael has done a tremendous job of keeping his father's legacy going. The day-to-day -day stuff is all Michael. Michael Torgan, equally uh, a brilliant, wonderful curator, a totally different personality, but courageous and incredibly inspired. And and uh, gives me joy every time I come to the New Beverly and get to hang out with uh, with Michael. And I can see Sherman in Michael. I can see that he's he's got you know he likes to let the program speak for for itself. You know he's responsible for a lot of people being exposed to a lot of movies that they wouldn't normally necessarily seek out on their own. Michael's about the best boss I think I've ever had. I have an easy job because Michael works too much. He's great and super chill. Um, and he reminds me of Moby. My kids love the place, especially my oldest daughter. Michael Torgan gave us the run of the place. He let us throw her 10th birthday party at the New Beverly. And uh, I get choked up thinking about it because it means a lot to me. And uh, to think that somebody, you know, would care enough to create that kind of uh, experience for a little kid, uh, that's, I'll never forget that. You know, I don't have to think of another reason why the New Beverly is uh, important to me. That's the tiny New Beverly family. <laughs> There's a magic alchemy that happens with an audience. When a whole bunch of people are watching a movie and, and following a story that's unique, I think, to all other um, arts because it's a communal experience where you're actually having the same emotional responses at the same time. There's a reason they're called crowd pleasers. It's because like the audible reaction of an audience is, is very infectious. You need that audience interaction to make certain things funny. Like Mark's brother is Buster Keaton, Jackie Chan. You got a room full of people laughing. It's it just like it, it's like a chemical reaction between people where one person starts laughing the next. 
If I'm watching a horror film, it's much more scary if I can feel the 200 people around me are just as scared as I am, rather than I'm by myself. Or if you're watching a movie and at the end it's really sad and you can hear everybody else crying. It just amplifies the experience of what the film is. All of those emotional reactions are muted when you're in the man cave and you're by yourself and you're watching some huge screen, no matter how good the sound and visuals are. To have people kind of in league with one another, in emotional sync, is unique in society. And movies provide that, even if it's a bad movie, even if people are laughing because it's cheesy. It's still kind of bonding people together, and I think that's the magic of that medium. When I started going, taking movies around to festivals and seeing the same movie over and over with different audiences, you really realize how different a personality every single audience has. I feel like when you go to the multiplex now, there's a real lack of consideration. Uh, people don't care about the movies, they don't care about their fellow audience members. It's so hard to go now without somebody texting or somebody talking. There is nothing that makes me more angry than someone ruining my movie experience. Um, I have almost gotten into a fist fight. I take it really seriously. I'm a, a maniac about uh, people talking. If I see the light of a cell phone, I'd lose my mind. Like it's because it's our little house. Did you know it was that you? I didn't turn off my cell phone. No, uh, fire. I always turn it off in the... Get out. This it's, is appropriate it's, it's actually, at this it's moment. It's actually your girlfriend. You're, you're, fucking with, <laughs> you're fucking with our movie experience, literally. Put your fucking phone away. I once tweeted through a movie, and I didn't read the reactions until afterwards. I was, felt I was so clever. And then afterwards, it was two hours of, what kind of prick are you tweeting through a movie? And I was, oh shit, I forgot. I think if you have a texting session movie theater, you should also have a sterilization section, and they're immediately sterilized, so they can't have kids. And then you go, okay, that's, that's the trade-off. You want to text during a movie, we get to sterilize you. That's the deal. It could be a state-run thing. I'd sponsor it. The New Beverly, we don't really have those problems. The obligatory, please don't turn your cell phones on. Announcement, please don't be a jerk. Because people are there to see this movie and they're really into it. What's wonderful about the new Beverly is the is the camaraderie that forms. They absolutely adore cinema. And they're also the most enthusiastic audience you will ever find. They appreciate the work that goes into making a film better than any other audience, I think. And that really actually does something for what you're seeing on the screen and brings it alive and adds this, this other dimension to it. The new Beverly crowds are just genuine. They're there to have fun. They're there to love cinema. Uh, and that sounded super pretentious. Yeah, a lot of the people that are there are, are filmmakers or stars of films and so forth who have incredible stories to tell and have known, you know, you're looking at a movie by Peckinpah, they work with Peckinpah. When I go there, I always learn something that I never knew before about the movies I'm watching. How would you describe the clientele? I would describe the clientele of the New Beverly as people who make me nervous. When you go to the New Beverly, you have to figure in time for people watching because it's the best place in the city to see people who are like you, except you can judge them as weirder than you. So, and they're not. They're totally as weird as you are. It's wonderful to just go somewhere where everyone's like you and you're accepted. Frankly, we are a large group of weirdos. Fringe dwellers come drifting in at times and what have you, but that's cool. Kind of like a, uh, a party to which everyone's invited. I have slightly lower brow taste than, than you do, so I go to a lot of the more grindhouse-y, yeah. genre-y kind of programs. You still see the, you still see the crusty folks, the ne'er-do-wells showing mm. up for those uh What do you like, do you screens. like that? No. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, no. We're all sort of different kinds of freaks, but we all are freaks and we all love each other and we all have fun together. It was to give self to any kind of formality would ruin the vibe. My dream was that you would know my name when I walked up <laughs> to the new Beverly. It's a little creepy. Yeah, like my dream was that, was that they would, was that I, it would be like cheers. Was that somebody, would be like, hey Noah, hey, welcome, well, you know, good to see you. And uh, when that started to happen, I felt like I belonged. You achieved mm. that dream. Yeah, I, I mean, I really feel like I've kind of reached where I want to be. We have regulars who show up every day, regardless of what we're showing, because they just want to be at the theater. Colorful characters around town, and you can, uh, 
you feel a little bit special being able to have that kinship. <laughs> I spend a lot of time at the New Beverly, and it's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of attached to the place. You know, I, I uh, definitely, if, if it's showing something that I haven't seen before, um, you know, I try to make a point of going to see it unless I have a good reason not to, because that's the environment I like. And if you like that sort of environment, then you should support that kind of environment. I've been known to plan my, uh, my time around the new Beverly. And like, you can't write this stuff. There's Scruncher, popcorn lady, who comes in always late, about an hour late into the movie every time. And she will buy a popcorn and then she will take her fist and push the popcorn down into the bag as much as she possibly can and then make us refill it. No matter how high you fill the bag full of popcorn, she will find a way, find the little air pockets and mash it down. She's a doozy. And I've tried, like I filled that thing, I'm like, she's not scrunching this time. And then nope, she finds a way to scrunch. So this old man, we called him Zombie Man, and he would, in the movie, make this noise periodically. It would always be like the most touching scene in the movie and he'd go, <sighs> and everyone would laugh. And he would do this periodically throughout the movie. And then he would fall asleep, but he would fall asleep slumped over the chair in front of him. So he'd be like this. And people would come out to the lobby and be like, um, I think there's a dead guy in the back row. And we'd be like, no, no, it's just zombie and he's not dead, he's just sleeping. There's a guy who could come in who would tell me a lot about his diabetes and order a Diet Coke and then proceed to order like six different kinds of candy bars and then would go away and come back an hour to the movie and ask for more candy. But I had to get a Diet Coke because he has diabetes. And at some point I would ask Michael like, should I cut him off? Like I feel like a bartender. Like at what point where I'm like, you've had enough, sir. No, no more. Yeah, there's just, there. It's, it's an amazing group of people. And then like then behind them, Matt Dillon will walk in the door. It's a really eclectic clientele. A well-dressed man who is this youngish man who comes in who is always dressed to the nines. I was raised by movies. He's got a fedora, he's got his three-piece suit, he's got his pocket watch, he's got his handkerchief, he has his gloves, he has his trench coat. Looks like he stepped out of 1940, like just amazing. He speaks very properly, so he makes you, so he's like, good evening, and, and how are you doing this evening? I'm like, I am doing fine, how are you doing? Why am I talking like this? And always pays for everything in $2 bills. And he only pays in $2 bills? People like a $2 bill, it brightens up their day. They think it's special. It's worth a lot more than $2 to them. Corky Baines, um, a, a former roadie, Fraggy Pop, uh, who was a hardcore drug addict, then had three heart attacks, and then found Buddhism. Um, and he's like super perma-fried, but he's so nice, and like the uh, most, you know, sweetest, sweetest guy, and loves this place. I'm Corky, and you know, I, I come to the theater, and I call it Sundays a lot, because. I'm riding the bus now, so I'm, I'm a Sunday guy now. And I come in and I walk in and I make sure right away I start checking things my, out of my old habits and make sure the seats are good. He was struggling with his weight a bit um, and he was a hardcore soda junkie. So I had to start weaning him off. Like when he would come to ask me, I'd be like, mm, I would, he asked me for like a large soda and then I'd give him a water. He'd be like, no, but I, and I would just stare at him. And then he would take the water and then eventually he would learn that when I was working, he wasn't allowed to have soda. Um, I can give him his popcorn, he could maybe have a candy bar, but he's only allowed to have water with me. Yeah, because I'm a little overweight. In the old roadie days, I was real thin, but since I've gotten out touring a lot, and she said, so no more sodas on Sundays, so this is, I think it's almost two years now, and no, no soda Sundays. <laughs> Freddie, he uh, used to drive for Orson Welles. I'm Freddie, I'm a regular at the New Beverly, and I've been coming to the theater for, uh, two or three times a week and over a 30 year period. But the great thing about Freddie is that he constantly is bringing us newspaper clippings of things that are like film relevant, like if somebody dies. He always cuts out, almost like in a serial killer way, these, these clippings and then, you know, posts them on the glass doors. And then she saw me with a, with, a, with a clipping out of the LA Times from the obit and she said, who died this time? He's at the back of the theater every night and if you can't get an interesting piece of information out of that guy, you're just not listening because he's fascinating. One of our regulars who is just the sweetest man on earth, his name is Clue Gulliger, and he's been an actor professionally since the 40s. He had his own television show called The Virginian. I mean, this guy is a legend unto himself. Where else are you gonna go to a movie theater and be able to talk to somebody as awesome as Clue Gulliger? The last seven or eight years, 
I have considered the new Beverly my living room. He gives you a good insight about films because he's got a great point of view. He is a true cineast. The day that Clue Gulliger told me that he was a big Harmony Korine fan, I about fell over. I see between 15, 16, 17 films every week at the New Beverly. And every time he gets in there, he sits down and puts his little piece of paper over his seat to keep people from sitting by his seat or like the two seats next to him. Uh, I've saved uh, the seats to the left and to the right uh, for the filmmakers and the people who uh, want to ask uh, filmmaking questions. So uh, this, is, this is a very prioritized uh, area of the theater. Well, clues all the way over uh, stage right. You know right? he has a little plaque on his chair, right? No, I didn't. Yes, and we named the seat after him on the Beverly. The Clue Gulliger seat, I put the tag on the seat. I don't know of too many theaters that actually dedicate a seat. What happens when someone sits in Clue's seat? Shit goes down. To have that seat and to be honored by, by, by folks, you know, you say, well, it's only because you were an actor big shit actor. No, it, it went beyond that. We at the theater, we, I don't think we think that way. Uh, I, I think we think in terms of people. And uh, that's what made me feel good. It's bittersweet with Clue because when his wife was alive, they used to come to the Beverly Cinema on, on a regular basis, sitting up front and all of that. And it, he was de devastated when she died and he told me, he did say that this is my new home now. Raison d'etre, that's my reason for living. When my wife died, I had no reason for living. So I chose that, the new Beverly. I <laughs> said, not really a substitute, but it, it worked for me. I've gotten a lot of friends from sitting in the dark. I've gotten Frank Capra, I've gotten John Ford, Marcello Mastriani, Francois Truffaut, all kinds of wonderful, interesting friends. And I've gotten a lot of good friends also in the lobby, good, close, very dear friends. And they will be dear friends to me until I die. Music to the ears of the hungry. The sizzle of a mouth-watering hamburger. Fresh, lean beef done to a golden brown, couched in a soft bun, and garnished to taste. Man, that's hunger heaven. And you'll feel like you're heaven sent when you get one at our refreshment stand. You know, we get all kinds of film fare there, you know, everything from Judgment at Nuremberg to the to the blood farmers, you know. How's that for a segue? <laughs> it's the most fantastic programming in cinema I've ever been around. And I've really been around. The way that the new Beverly has always been programmed, with the double features, with the consistency within the double feature, the idea that you're going to kind of get a, a crash course in a, in a filmmaker, in an actor, in a writer or a style. You can drag someone who's never seen a uh, Preston Sturgis movie and say, here, this is great. Here, this is Billy Wilder. This is Howard Hawks. This is Buster Keaton. Some places that are like super duper pretentious revival-y places where they're like, we're playing only silent Polish shorts from the 30s. But there's other places where they go to the other extreme and they're just like, we're all crazy heads blowing up, Dennis Hopper's in everything kind of places where you're only going to see movies like Ironically and The New Bev Strikes a really nice balance. Um, grab a calendar on your way out and make this your regular spot for excellent movies. I've seen New Bev. I love the way this is put together because it's so like, because look at that. That always goes on the, that always goes on the cork board right there. You unfold it thus. You put it on your fridge. Ooh, this is, so they would have a different, uh, a different color every month, and so you get this rainbow effect when you have them all stuck on your mm -hmm. fridge at the end at the end of a year. And they do double features, and they just lay it out calendar style, if you will. I've seen the calendar from 1978, like the very first calendar that he did, and it looks exactly the same to the calendars that we print today. The Moon Beverly calendar is like. Uh, 
It's like the golden ticket. I mean, every time I see it and I see, oh, that's the new one. It's just fun to leave through and see the pictures and the descriptions. And I take great joy in that. When I walked into, into the new bed and looked at, at the calendar, same feeling I had, just, ah, oh, warmth that comes over you. After a while, it's kind of like an addiction. You look at it and you go, how in the world am I gonna make it through July without seeing that? And when you miss it, it really does feel like withdrawal too. It's like, oh no. I love collecting them. It's just such a piece of history itself. There's never gonna be that exact programming for a month ever again. Going to the New Beverly on a normal night is great, but going when there's a guest programmer is amazing. The way it works is that somebody, either a director or an actor, um, will program for a week or two weeks and they'll program all the double bills. Um, and they're movies that either they've meant a lot to them or they've never seen before. And usually they'll bring you know special guests with them to help them intro the movies or to do Q&A afterwards. March and April of 2007, Quentin Tarantino did a two-month run of Grindhouse movies, and these were mostly from his personal collection. That's almost like he's showing you the DVD extras ahead of the fact of his next film. In 2007, we had a double feature of Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, and Edgar Wright contacted us and said, can I come down and talk? And we said, yeah, of course you can. And it went fantastically well. It was sold out, and Edgar was really, really generous and lovely. He and I got to talking, and I said, you should come and program some of the movies you love at the theater. And he said, okay. And so that December of 2007, Edgar Wright came to the theater, and he programmed a week of his favorite movies. And these movies were ones that he had loved watching growing up, and movies that had inspired him to be a director. Which was amazing, because it was like a great way to see a lot of the films that uh, I loved on the big screen, sometimes for the first time. And also, you know, the great thing about Los Angeles is that you can get pretty good guests. It's a treat to see the Monkeys film head on the big screen. It's even better to have Mickey Dolan to talk about it, or to show like Bugsy Malone and Phantom of the Paradise and get Paul Williams to come and talk about it. American Wealth in London and getting John Landis to come and talk about it. It's like a dream come true. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen the film or how well you know it, it will never be as good as watching it with other people. In fact, there are some films I've watched here when doing my season that I, I feel like I will probably never watch again because it will never be as good as that screening. One of the coolest things that happened was when uh, Edgar had his show and David Lynch showed up. That was crazy. Edgar showed Wild at Heart. I was so excited because I hadn't seen it in a long time. And uh, Laura Dern was there, which was really, really neat. We have a back door that, you know, if guests can come through the back door and kind of surprise everybody. Uh, so Laura Dern comes in and then she says, I, I bought some brought somebody with me. And then like, oh wait, with well, this someone in the back, this can't be safe. And then fucking David Lynch walks out. Allah. Twin Peaks just emerging from some sort of netherverse. I did not know there were doors behind that red curtain. Either he had been there the entire time or he was able to teleport. People go crazy in the cinema, like huge, like standing out. And then he was all cool and just chatted about movies and was so normal and relaxed. And we were all just like, oh, now I'm doing a QA with David Lynch. I am not prepared for this at all. It was the first time I'd ever seen Edgar tongue tied. The first question that came out of my mouth when I was trying to interview David Lynch was just complete nonsense. Uh, you know, I don't know, how do you, I mean, um, yeah, this question's not going very well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely starstruck. Some people, like, uh, had gone out for, like, a smoke or to get something to eat between the films. One of whom was Richard Kelly. That was, that was tragic. I go on Twitter and I find out that, that David Lynch and Laura Dern showed up out of nowhere and it was just this mind-blowingly great Q&A with my hero, David Lynch, and I was um, getting Italian food down the street. He texted me furiously later saying, why didn't you tell me David Lynch was gonna be there? I wouldn't have gone to get something to eat. I said, I didn't know he was coming. And I've never met him since. It's literally like he kind of like came from the curtains, just like he came from the red curtain and he went back through the red curtain, and I've never seen him since. It's always exciting to see what the directors pick. Because then you look at the list of movies, you go, oh, wow, no wonder this guy's so great. Or, wow, no wonder this guy's such a loser. If somebody that you admire says, you should see this movie, I think it really gives you a better incentive to go see it. And I think that that's part of what the guest programming series is for. That was one of the best weeks of my life, actually, being able to choose films I've always wanted to see projected for the new Beverly, you know, having a, a week worth of you know, my favorite films. I mean, I, I, I loved it. 
Christmas came early for Stuart Gordon that year. It's very exciting, kind of a dream come true to be able to pick the movies. And then the thing that they don't tell you until you get to program is that you get to pick the trailers too. And there is a massive library uh, that, that comes from the network of friends that support the New Beverly. Now when Patton Oswalt was a programmer, and boy, uh, we were right on it. The uh, Palom 123 Charlie Varick double bill, that was awesome. Wh who else is gonna book that? The main focus of the programming that I've done so far is I'm showing movies that I wanna watch with an audience. They're movies I've either seen with my, by myself or I've seen them years ago with an audience and I love the experience and I wanna see it again. Yeah, I got to program a week for uh, uh, of, of con men movies and uh, yeah, I did not feel worthy. And, and we had uh, fun. We did like yeah. a musical performance before one of them and we did like a, I did like a PowerPoint thing and talked a little bit about the movies and showed like a little short before each one. Well, how can you not be thrilled by your movie selling out when they tanked and when they were originally released? Well, welcome. There's a lot of you. I'm, I'm happy to see this many people showing up at this hour to see this movie. If you had all showed up in 1984, we could have run for more than two weeks. What the new Beverly has allowed me to do is not only see my films in, in 35 mil, but also connect with the audience that grew up with the films. And it's been a terribly rewarding uh, process. And I, I, I'm very, very grateful. I was really impressed when uh, when Carnahan and Leota came. Narc and Smoking Aces, right? Smoking Joe. Smoking Joe. Please put your hands together for a warm New Beverly welcome for the director of The Gray and Narc and Smoking Aces, Joe Carnahan. To watch it like that with that group of people is to be in this wonderful time capsule and to step back and you can be a viewer. Who, who, now who's seen The Gray? Has anybody seen The Gray? All right. All right, who hates yeah. the ending? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, there's one guy, two guys. God, shut up, I didn't ask. It was really cool to see Joe talk about their perspective on movies, and, and Joe said something that actually I think about all the time. Never go bad on your fellow filmmakers. I don't care who they are. As long as people are still going to the movies, we'll all have a job. So always get up for those guys, regardless if they're not, if they don't share the same creative thesis that you, that you share. I think it's important. Always pull from one another. That completely changed my perspective on looking at his movies, which are these sort of like kind of macho, you know, dude movies where you feel like there's a winner and a loser. That was pretty special, you know, because you're, I mean, you're, you know, you're seeing it with a group of people that are so appreciative and it's never disappointed me in that way, the new Beverly. I've always had, I've never had a bad crowd. I've never sat with a bad crowd. I never showed, just didn't screen a film with a bad crowd. And invariably, you always get the best questions. When you're in a, in a place where you're with this crowd who's all excited and waiting for this movie to start, and then the director of this movie walks up, or the star of this movie walks up to introduce this, this is just gonna heighten your experience even more. And then you're watching the movie and something comes up and you're like, oh, well, why did this happen? And you're like, well, I can ask them afterwards. And it just, so it just kind of adds to your experience and makes it something more than just a passive experience where you're just sitting and you're watching a movie and then you're going home. You're actually talking to the people around you about it and you're talking to the director about it. So it becomes a way more interactive experience. Q&As are like in the rest of the city are like snobby and it's look how much I know and oh I'm so important to the world of cinema and they're like make you want to kill yourself. At the New Beverly it's someone that's every bit as big a nerd as you are nerding out. <laughs> I've really geeked out over Sam Walker right now so my brain's not. I'm usually much more eloquent. The New Beverly it's fun. It's just fun. It's, it's so informal. And the directors there are always very accessible. It's not like they're gonna be whisked off, you know, into their limousine or something. You know, they're gonna be there and hang with you. There's something about walking through the doors of the New Beverly that's the great equalizer. And what's really nice about this theater is I think people, I think maybe because of the size of it, like, so people are a little bit more candid. And it's awesome, like, they will go, no, it sucked to work with that guy. He showed up drunk and late, and you're like, Yes, drunk and late, I'm in. It's tremendously inspiring because it reminds you why you do what you do or why you're, and also why you're fortunate enough to do what you do. As a huge film junkie, this is one of my favorites. Oh, thank um, you, man. 
this is what it's all about, you know, is, is the movie and the crowd and that uh, connection and that experience. She'll guarantee mouth-watering satisfaction. Mmm. And now he slips his costume on a beautiful golden bun. There's his cue break, break. to go out on stage. He's the natural. He's the rage. Meet this person at a tea at our refreshment counter. Treat the family. I mean, the theater, when Sherman was running it the whole time, he was always about to quit and give up because it was losing money and it was a nightmare to run and, you know, and attendance was drooping because people wanted to watch DVDs at home instead of having, like, the group experience. I think he had just about given up. And I, for one, don't blame him. Can you talk about Sherman a bit? Well, I gotta stop. Sure, <laughs> okay. <sighs> He was always real cool. You know, he let you come in the theater and he'd go, Court, can you fix this? I'd go, yeah, because I always had tools with me. And I'd fix the bathrooms or I'd fix something. But he was always real nice to me. And, you know, it was real good. And then when we buried him, I threw a bunch of new Beverly Flyers and we finished, there's next week's show. In 2007, Sherman Torgan died unexpectedly. He had a heart attack while riding his bike. It, it's devastating whenever something like that happens. And when there's somebody as cool as Sherman, I've had other bosses, you know, actually pass away. And I've never really felt it as much as uh, when Sherman went. I remember the day before he died, I had been at the theater to watch a pirate double feature. And as I was leaving, Sherman was sitting on the stairs. I said, I'll see you tomorrow, Sherman. And he said, absolutely. And uh, that was the last time that I ever spoke to him. Sherman's death was really hard for me in a lot of ways. He was a friend and he was a fellow employee and he was someone I looked up to. The thing that Sherman's death made me feel is um, unfairness. He had done something so wonderful with his life and was loved by so many people and started something so fantastic and he was taken away and that was really really painful and something that really affected me and made it hard to work at the theater for a while but also made it great to be there where he had been. There was just a huge amount of flowers and tributes and candles outside and it was a beautiful display of the love that people had for, for this man in the theater. When Sherman passed away, that really had, I think, more of an impact than we probably ever suspected because he created something that was so important to all of us. Uh, I remember thinking, I, this is, they're gonna, this is, it's, it's gonna be it's, over. It's gonna it's be gonna over. Be yeah. Like it's, it's, because he was the new Beverly. I don't think we had a lot of hope that the theater would stay in business because it really had gotten to the point where Sherman was running it as a, a labor of love. And I don't know if he was even making money. You don't get into repertory to become rich. You do it because you love what you do and you love the films and you love the people who come to see the films. The landlord, Howard Zeem, sold off the theater days after Sherman died uh, without asking the family. He sold it to some people who were going to turn it into a Chipotle and a Supercuts, which is about the biggest knife you could stab into the death of the New Beverly. Because Sherman was the owner of the theater, not of the property, not of the, the land of the building. Um, that's one of those, again, things that people have trouble separating in their mind. Like most, most businesses, it's in a plaza, it's in a strip mall. They don't own the strip mall. They, they own the business. They rent the hole in the wall, you know. It's the same kind of thing. The New Beverly rented the building. Even though it was designed as a movie theater, it could have been anything else. We really didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't have the capital to buy it. And, um, of course, Michael, his son, was devastated and not in a state to be dealing with this kind of business plan. We were all kind of really expecting the worst. 
But luckily, Sherman came to the rescue. We found the original contract that Sherman had signed with Howard, and it, luckily, it gave us a right of first refusal. So that way, uh, Quentin Tarantino, who had been coming to the theater since he was a youth and loved the place, was able to step in and buy the building out from Howard uh, and the Chipotle guys. Um, so, which, so essentially, Quentin Tarantino saved the theater because we were going to close. And he stepped in and saved it and made sure that the New Beverly would stay the New Beverly forever. There's the, the business that's in the Be New Beverly, and then there's the landlord. The landlord's very supportive and we all love him, thank you. They kind of kept it, I think, low key in intentionally and also too, because it's still the family business. And then Quentin was able to come in and contribute, which has been wonderful. And I think it's also, it not only gave the, the theater a facelift, but also gave the theater some new energy and it exposed it to more patrons. And I felt like that was really the breath of fresh air that I think the theater needed after Sherman's death that kind of gave you hope that it was gonna be okay. I think that if Sherman were here today and he could see what happened after he was gone and how the place continued and the people that stepped up to help the place continue and that the incredible job that his son is doing now in his absence, I think he'd be really happy and really proud. I'm gonna have a pizza and popcorn and ice cream. And I'm gonna have a burger with fries and a soft drink. Yum, yum, <laughs> yum. In November 2011, we received at the New Beverly a letter from one of the major studios who announced that at the end of 2012, they would be stopping production of 35 millimeter prints. And this was something that made me very, very nervous because although it didn't affect us immediately, I could see down the line and how it would eventually affect revival cinemas and the New Beverly. Uh, what I did was I created a petition uh, not to fight the studios, but to ask for their cooperation. I knew that I couldn't change the digital changeover. I can't stop that, that's beyond my power. What I was trying to do was to ask the studios during this conversion to just remember that there are revival cinemas and that there are lots of people who really care what format they watch their movies on and to ask them to let their prints that are already printed and archived remain available for revival cinema indefinitely. I put it up online and it got a great tremendous amount of press and a lot of support. We got over 10,000 signatures within three months and they were from all over the world from 60 different countries and it was really fantastic to see all these heartfelt comments from people saying how much 35 meant to them or how they were projectionists and they've lost their job. It's a really, really widespread and personal thing. I couldn't have signed the petition fast enough because the fact that people don't count film as an important thing to save is bewildering. I th that makes as much sense as someone walking into a museum, taking the Mona Lisa off the wall, breaking it across their knee and saying, I have a digital picture of that. It makes no sense. It's infuriating. I can't believe that film stock is held to a different standard than other mediums of art. It's exactly the same. And I understand that there is a time and place for finances, for seeing the cost that storing film incurs. I get it, but find a way to save these things. You're never gonna get them back. You're never going to get back a print of a small movie made in 1942 that no one's ever seen and nobody wants to see on DVD. You're never getting that back. There's no way to recreate that. And everything that all of those people worked for, everything that that camera operator, that director, that extra, that craft services person worked for together is gone. It's completely gone. And just saying that sends a chill down my spine. It's not like this petition is going to be submitted to somebody who will then do something about it, but it starts this dialogue going in the, the kind of the sphere of people who care about this stuff and it gets people realizing oh my god this could actually go away and this thing could actually end up affecting my ability to see these films the way they were meant to be meant to be seen yeah I think you you hit people where where they live the finality of it that the studios are taking this step of cutting off sending prints out I think that just kind of snapped a lot I know it snapped my head up it, obviously, it's costly to store them, and it and it's, um, requires a lot of space and so on. But again, so do a lot of things. 
that that aren't as important. And uh, I just think this is about preserving historical documents. It's, you know, it's kind of the end of film more than just the end of 35. It seems we're in danger of losing something quintessential about it without even realizing it. First run and revival single screen theaters are barely squeaking by these days, let's be honest. To ask them all to upgrade to a digital projector is a huge thing. Digital projectors cost anywhere from $75,000 to $200,000. And if you're a family run one screen theater, you're not gonna have that immediate capital to do that. And I know that a lot of small theaters haven't been able to make this changeover, that they're dying. The studios, especially the ones that have active libraries, are refusing to ship 35 millimeter prints in some cases even junking them because they don't want to be bothered with it anymore. And I thought that's ridiculous to deny theaters like the New Beverly or the Cinematheque the opportunity to show a film is nonsense. Film should always be available as an, an exhibition medium. I think it's important for places like New Beverly to preserve that ethos because it, it gives someone an opportunity to witness it in present day as opposed to seeing it in a museum as a, a reference of a, a time gone by. What is going to be troublesome is the notion that studios don't want to circulate existing 35 millimeter prints. There's an audience and, and the studios just see this as small potatoes and not worth their while. But you know, it doesn't cost any more to cater to that audience. Nobody is against digital. When I see a good looking digital presentation, I'm just as wowed as when I've seen a good 35 millimeter presentation. Let it never be suggested that this is supposed to be an either or. This is supposed to be a you and me. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever show anything in digital, but what I'm saying is just don't get rid of 35 millimeter. Don't let this past die because it's part of film's history. It's a tiny number of the silent films exist because the studios destroyed them to get the silver out of the negative. They didn't think they were worth money unless you could re-release it or something. It's a miracle that some films exist, period. Nobody expected silent films to go away. The idea was that silent films and talkies would coexist, just like black and white and color, flat and scope, 2D and 3D. And film and digital should be allowed to coexist. Filmmakers and audiences should have a choice. This is a particularly terrible uh, situation because um, they say, well, you could just run it on digital. Well, we all know that the only movies that are gonna be put on digital are gonna be Casablanca and The Wizard of Oz and all the movies everybody you know, has seen and are famous. But the kind of movies that revival houses live on, the quirky independent movies, the offbeat B pictures, all those kind of things, they're not gonna be available on digital. And uh, they're either gonna have to not show those pictures or they're gonna have to go out of business. And I, I really am afraid that the studios don't care. Every single time we go to a new technology, things are going to be lost. They didn't transfer everything from 35 to VHS. And everything from VHS didn't necessarily go to DVD. So to count on the fact that there will be a full accountability of a catalog, top to bottom, that will be transferred to digital and everything else, no, that's foolish because that's just never going to happen. It's not some idea that, you know, oh, you're just anti-digital or something. No, it's what we can absolutely lose. I have seen Michael post signs up in the booth that says, this is the only print of this film, and it is not out on DVD, and it is not out on VHS. Then I'll watch the film, and it's amazing. But you know this movie by some random Japanese director is never going to be transferred into a digital print that they can ship around. Like, no way. So what happens to that movie if 35 million goes away? That movie just dies. So a lot of the time, you'll see movies that are out of print. Um, you'll, they'll never be released. How do you see these films if not for places like the New Beverly? The connection to the New Beverly and the connection to film are too interlocked. They can't be pulled apart. The problem with uh, revival theaters is particularly acute because uh, they've long since uh, relied on studio prints and uh, collector prints and, you know, prints, 35 millimeter prints. But I understand that when they uh, pony up a little bit of money for people's uh, theaters to uh, go digital. Part of the deal is that if they agree to get rid of their 35 millimeter equipment. Uh, so 
uh, the, 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 a number of studios have just simply stopped supplying the prints. They have the prints, but they just don't, they don't want to encourage their use. I think they really would just like 35 million to go away. There's an agenda to make this digital revolution complete because it's vastly economically uh, advantageous to film financiers and distributors. Well, you know, now we have um, a dueling, uh, well, it's not a duel anymore, it's a battle and it, it's more or less lost, but uh, we have um, 35 millimeter versus digital. And uh, as we know, the, um, the studios have been trying to uh, get rid of 35 millimeter for years because of the bulkiness and the fact that you have to rewind it and you have to mail it and you have to pay for it and you have the projectionist and all that. And it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a comparatively cumbersome formula compared to getting a thing in a box and putting it in a digital projector. I mean, this all happened very quickly. I mean, everybody knew that this digital thing was coming, but I don't think anybody quite realized how fast it was gonna happen and how, uh, at the expense of 35 millimeter, it was going to be. There are many pluses to 35 millimeter, uh, one of which is that uh, it, it, it is the, the way that movies were seen from the beginning of movies. And there's something more romantic about shadows on a screen than there is looking into a box with, you know, ones and twos in it. You look at film that has been around for over 100 years and has really never changed formats. And there's a reason why it's been around so long is because it's something that is really stable and that if you have it in a location with the right humidity and the right temperature, it's gonna last a really, really long time. Digital at the moment is changing formats and upgrading so fast that we have no idea where it's gonna be in five or 10 years. Every day we find out, oh gee, my computer is now out of date. My software is out of date. My cell phone is out of date. It's, you can't keep up with it. And it's like a financial commitment that we've made that we have to keep assimilating new, newer and bigger technology. That's very much the reality in the movie theaters as well, because every time digital technology is in place, three months later, they say, oh, well, now it's time for an upgrade. Those guys aren't paying for that. We're gonna pay for it. And that's it, man. You've got that 35 millimeter projector and you've got that 35 millimeter print. That's like the rock of Gibraltar. It's there, it's unchanging, and it doesn't come down and hit all of us on the head where it makes it too expensive for us to go to the movies. If it was a different format, I think people would be a lot angrier. So what if we say, okay, we're not gonna make books anymore. We're not gonna make printed books. You can have them on your Kindle and they'll come out like that, but bookstores, no more, no more printed books. People would flip. And I think that this is very similar because it's no more physical prints. It's like looking at the Mona Lisa or Monet's water lilies on a piece of paper or that big. It's just, that's not what the artist intended. And I think the art of cinema is really important because it is an art. And as soon as it becomes just this sort of disposable piece of flotsam, then we might as well just cash it in. I mean, I, I know as a filmmaker, my movie is different if you watch it this big or this big or on your iPhone this big. If you're seeing it in a, a cinema projected correctly. My fear with digital is, is it gonna be, does it go the way of like the, you know, like the MP3? Are we, are we just squashing everything into this mid-range and we've lost the, the high end, the treble, we've lost the sub, we've lost the, we, you know, we're not hearing that anymore. You know, you need, you need only look, listen to like, you know, put on an old album and you, God, you realize the sound is quality is so much more superior to what we have now. But again, we've been kind of led down the primrose path of digital is the, is the way of the future. And that's the only way to go. I don't want to see that happen with movies. Are they making 35 millimeter prints of Looper? Yes, they are. The final stage of the process was seeing the DCP and then seeing the different film prints, the ones struck straight from the digital out and the ones struck from an inner negative made from that. And what were the differences? What could you tell? Yeah, oh yeah, God, you could tell it was night and day. It's interesting. So the DCP, the digital of Looper, looked pretty much exactly like the digital version we were color correcting. It looked fine. Um, the film that was directly out, because at first they split screen it with the digital. And when they first do that, your eye just automatically says, oh, that film, that film one looks fucked up because it's jittering a little bit because of the registration, it's a little bit crunchier. And then they take the digital away and your eye adjusts to it and you, you, it suddenly it becomes the version that you favor. It looks like a movie. It looks like the thing that we, that we grew up watching. It, it's got a life to it.
It's a fairly tragic situation for um, uh, posterity because there is no such thing as digital posterity. You should only convert to digital, you know, if, if it's a valid exhibition medium. Films need to be preserved on film, and that will never change. And anybody who thinks that digital is some kind of a storage medium is, is an idiot and is really fooling themselves. I mean, there are movies that were shot in the early days of digital where the original media has already become corrupted. And the, the sad fact is that I think that most people don't care about these nuances that we're talking about. And maybe they shouldn't care about them. If they're getting the, the, the information and they're engrossed in the narrative and they fall in love with the characters, I'm sure this is splitting hairs for them. But for those of us that enjoy the part of the process that is the craft part, this is what craft is about. There's this romance now on your iPhone and stuff for Hipstamatic and Instagram and all these things that are aping lo-fi image making because it's not just nostalgia. There's something to be said for not seeing everything clearly. There, there's a appeal to things that are pristine and new, but in, for me personally, there's a far greater appeal to things that show the wear of time. If the image is too perfect or too slick or too beautiful, it's got no, there's nothing evocative about it. There's nothing human about it. Some of what is appealing about, you know, seeing older movies is the feeling that they've been around for a while and here's the evidence. The print itself has a history to it. It's not just the movie. If you want to see a movie by a filmmaker who shot a movie in film, you should see it in film. It's the, it's the push-pull of the, the old world and you know, the, the new Jack way of doing things, you know what I mean? Um, uh, but I think side by side, I still prefer film. And it's an endless argument, but it all goes to the, to the value of revival houses and 35 mil print and keeping film alive. Because if you don't see film projected in a 35 mil projector, you'll never have the sense of, of what that presence is. It's very, very hard to describe, but there's a beauty with 35 mil that's gone with digital. Hey! They're ready, folks. It's one thing that the first run community doesn't understand about the repertory world is that it's really a brotherhood. You know, it's not competitive. Uh, everybody pulls for everybody. And if in Los Angeles, if you walk in to the American Cinematheque, for example, you will see calendars for the New Beverly and the New Art and, and the Cine Family and every other theater as well, because we all pull for each other because it just, everybody helps the other. It's not a cutthroat kind of deal. The Prince Charles is like a cinema um, that's right in the middle of London. It's just off a side street is this older cinema which shows second round movies. Prince Charles is uh, the absolute twin to the New Beverly uh, across the Atlantic Sea. Beautiful rep house, and they do it like the New Bev does. Double bill, have fun with it and shit, good times. I work at the Prince Charles Cinema, and I'm the PR manager and repertory programmer. My family don't think I have a real job. When I tell them I put films on in a cinema, they're like, that just happens. Without further ado, could you please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Julia Marquesi. Hello. 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 My name's on a fucking marquee in London, so my mind's really blown right now. If you don't know, I'm making a movie called Out of Print. It's about uh, revival cinema and the importance of revival cinema in 35 millimeter, and also about how repertory cinemas all need to band together to help each other and Paul was nice enough to ask me to come over and program. So I wanted to include this in my documentary <coughs> to show that all cinemas kind of love each other. And what made you ask me to come and do this? Having you here is having someone who shares the same love and passion for repertory cinema that I have. And for me, meeting those people is, is a joy. The New Beverly is a very famous theater. I think you pay attention to what people are programming around you and you pay attention to what people are programming around the world because it's nice to see that these are happening everywhere. Like, it, it, it's almost sometimes you can get caught up in thinking you're the only one doing it. And that can be a little, like, you know, fighting against this tidal wave of mainstream cinema, but 
knowing that there are these groups of little guys out there all doing the same sort of thing, you know, you're, you're, you're your own gang. And it doesn't, you, you, the new Beverly doesn't need to be in London for us to be like, to admire each other's programming. I, I, I don't feel competition with regards to, um, to repertory programming. I think it's very much a bit of a club. And I, I have friends who are programmers and there is always opinions and, uh, and everyone's looking at what everyone's doing. But at the end of the day, if someone screens something that I wanted to screen, they do it first, I'm glad someone's screening it. Something that's happening with the digital changeover in America is that part of the contract the studios are giving when they when you switch to digital is you have to get rid of your 35 millimeter projectors. Oh, wow. So side by side is like not, not an, an option. option. Yeah, that would be an interesting one to try and enforce over here. If they made us get rid of that, we would be able to show like 80% of the rep stuff we show because they just don't have it. We built our audience on showing older films and you don't want to lose that without going digital and 35 in both screens uh, we probably wouldn't be open because of the industry's changed not necessarily one that was we wanted to make but since doing that and bringing these newer films in we felt even stronger about our roots and our history which meant we didn't get rid of the 35 millimeter projections in fact we upgraded both if ever there was a 35 option, we would take it. But we do seek out prints. We do our best every time to, to put a print on because the audience respond to it. We screened To Live and Die in LA last week. It was a pretty busy house and I sat in front of someone. As soon as the film started, the guy behind me gasped and went, oh my God, it's an original print. And that, you don't get that with digital. And I understand the need for digital now, but you just don't get that, that spark in someone's eye when, when it starts. When I go and see a film, I want to see a film. <laughs> I'm fully accepting that very rarely will I see a new release on 35 mil, but I don't want to lose the history of the films that I loved, that I grew up on, to digital. And I understand some films don't exist on prints anymore. You know, having a digital copy of it is the only way this film is alive, and that's fine. But if there is a print, I don't see any reason why you're not screening that print. Why would you not want to see all those pieces of history, like every speck of dust on a print is a piece of history. And I know people like us get very romantic about it, but that's the whole point. Like film is romantic, like completely. It's, it's, it's creating a world in front of you that you just lose yourself in. And I think that when you watch a film and you see those marks and scratches, it's all part of the history of that film. It's been made and it's gone out there and it lives its life beyond production. And the life it lives beyond that production sticks to it. And you see that every time it screens. I think our current generation of filmmakers are clearly looking to the past. They show up at theaters all over the country that are playing old films. I think that the next generation of filmmakers, if they don't have that, then who are they gonna be looking to? Like, what are their influences? What, what's gonna be driving them to make movies? Are they gonna be inspired by whatever, you know, $300 million explosion epic? Or is he gonna be influenced by, you know, that quiet, intimate picture that like discusses real issues that potentially could affect the way that we think about our country and the world. It seems like we're pointing towards a really bright future for film and for filmmaking and uh, consequently film going, but it's something that is not like set in stone. If anything, it's probably more fragile than it's ever been. Just because it's dying doesn't mean it's dead. Doesn't mean you have to let it fall. You don't have to sit there and be like, what a shame, look at it die. Why won't anyone help it? You can help it, just go out there. Bam, eight bucks, I don't think that was eight, but I'm bad at miming, which is weird because I played Silent Bob. Um, you put down your eight bits and you've supported, you're part of the solution. You're helping pay for the storage and the preservation and the maintenance of the print you're about to watch. I want the New Beverly to be around for another 20 years or another 30 years because I want to take my children there. And I want them to be able to watch Cary Grant on the big screen and to see Charlie Chaplin because it's just an experience that cannot be replicated at home. It's a communal experience. That's what movie going has always been made to be. Well, it doesn't really matter if, you got, if the New Bev is showing 35, it's showing digital, if it's you standing there holding up film with a candle behind it, I'm still going to be there is it's magic it, it, and it's something that should be with us forever it's like home you know it doesn't take a lot of people to keep a revival theater going it just takes the faithful it's an amazing experience if you know it if you don't know 
you will be glad that you went. And you're supporting something so much bigger than just rear window on a big screen. You're kind of supporting an idea. But as our world gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets, I think, more confusing and more difficult to understand like how they help the individual can contribute to this cause. And I think it's as simple as just showing up to the movie theaters. There's, there is something powerful about people showing up in numbers. When you have a packed house, that says something that sends a message. This is a place that is worth protecting. So that's the first kind of easiest step, is just if there is a theater in your town like that, you should be going. I think collectively we could save Revival House movie theaters and radically change the course of movies. Went to the New Beverly on a Friday night to once again watch Casablanca with a group of strangers. And we're watching the movie. And everyone, clearly no one was seeing it for the first time. We're all just there. It's like going to a church service. I know, I know the, the liturgy here. I'm just gonna, let's just go, let's go through the, let's go through the Roman Catholic Mass right now. And Rick is saying goodbye to Ilsa on the, on the runway. And, he's, and he literally starts in the, you know, the, you're getting to that point. And then the, the film snaps and the screen all goes white. And there was first this moment of like, oh man, like of, of all the places. And then there was this kind of laughter, like of course it would break right there. And then while they were up there trying to fix it, everyone in this theater, everyone in the New Beverly that night or Friday night, half full, we all started whistling as time goes by until they fixed the film. And I just feel like in this transition now, from going to see it in theaters to now it's filming. We're just gonna have to keep whistling as time goes by until they fix it again and it goes on for a little while. And like, we're just gonna have to keep doing that. Like that's the version in my head of what, how you survive the transition. Now, we haven't discussed the old Beverly, uh, have we? There's the new Beverly, but we've not said anything about the old Beverly. I think the old Beverly deserves some attention because she was hot. Take one. Aggies. Mark. No, it's Joe. <laughs> I'm sweating like a crack whore with rent due. Want it louder? <clears throat> Put your finger in there. No, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, good. Maybe now that the fucking director's ready, we can start this thing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. That was very expensive. The new Beverly is like uh, a mission, right? In the sense of an old Spanish mission on the California coast. I like to show up to my features in a two-top little ensemble. It's, a, it's, a, it's got rainbows on it. Sugar sweet. You can YouTube me at Rainbow Tube Top. The new Beverly is like a primordial soup. Security level, ah, I can't even speak properly. Prolesitizing. Through projections. No, through projection. Prolesitizing. Project. <laughs> Bro. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, gluttons for punishment. Brain freezing up. I didn't say action. I didn't oh, say sorry, no, sorry. no, 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 you're good. You're good. I'm just teasing. Flames inside of my face. That's why I'm not gonna have kids. I just don't wanna watch that much like experimental improv theater. <laughs> <laughs> and have like Bogdanovich on a beanbag talking about the last picture show. Who wouldn't love that? Yeah. Can't even make a proper joke, folks. They're making dinosaurs? Oh my god! Let's go look! Why aren't we filming that? That seems way more exciting. Gently. You guys, I'm trying to watch this movie. If the tree falls in force, does it make a sound? And if a movie is not seen, does it exist? And if you say something and your wife isn't there, are you still wrong? Uh, I'm a little clue gulager, and uh, I'm a regular at the uh, New Beverly Cinema. That's me. Hot dog gulager. One, quick. I think she had me confused with George Papard. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Thank God no one was rolling. Mark. Uh, yeah, yeah.
They don't see Martin Scorsese blowing his nose, right? I'm sorry. He blowing, he blowing, he blowing. Go, 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 go. Huh? I can pop and lock and then whoa. Pausing for plane, pausing for plane. This is the musical number in the movie. Helicopters are exciting in their own way. Get in the chopper. Helicopter. Hold for the helicopter. I'm on the roll here, guys. To see, are we okay with the plane? Do we need to pause for the plane? Fuck you, plane! It's just like Hearts of Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could just dump the planes in. I just, you just put the plane, if, if you have a plane on your track, uh -huh. you just make sure that you put a couple of more planes in different places so people think that it's all part of the show. It's all part of the show. There you go. Hey. Free advice. Right. No, you're right. No, in all fairness, fuck me, guys, for sure. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Testing. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> we just burped at the same time. <laughs> I like that one. That was good. And uh, my relationship with the new Beb, mostly sexual. That was it right there. That was good. That was good. I have nothing further to say. You know that's all going in the blooper reel, right? All of it. Yes. Well, I watch this film. I doubt it. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.